lawyer or a law student, can you wave your right hand, please? And if you're a normal person, can you wave your left hand? Alright, let's do this together. Right hand, left hand. Great. Thanks for waving your rights to anything I tell you next about how lawyers can avoid being miserable. I'm Stella Long, and today I'm going to share with you my journey of how I became a lawyer and how I learned that I didn't want to make myself miserable during the process. I'm also going to share with you some ways of how you can speak up for yourself and hopefully become a happier and healthier lawyer. But first, let me start with a disclaimer, which is, I never wanted to be a lawyer. When I was 18 and finishing up my final year of high school in Singapore, my teacher told us that the only thing worse was going to law school. I remember thinking to myself, good thing I never want to do that. And then I was reading the Bible one day and I thought that God told me to be a lawyer. The verse that spoke to me was in Proverbs. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. I thought that this meant that I had to become a lawyer, which I never wanted. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried. So, I'm a lawyer. I've been that way for almost 10 years. I have a lot of white hair, but I use good skincare. In 2015, I embarked on an adventure to the Northern Territory in Australia. I was going to be an Aboriginal legal aid lawyer. I was going to live in the town of Catherine, which is a remote town of around 10,000 people. And I was going to service Aboriginal clients there, as well as in the surrounding remote communities, which could mean an eight hour drive away, or if the roads were flooded, I could take a plane, a small plane. I was really excited. Prior to this, I had mainly worked in law firms, and now I thought that I had a chance to really speak up for those who couldn't speak for themselves. My first client, he was an Aboriginal man who could make a few guttural sounds, but not much more than that. And most of my clients, they couldn't speak English, and I couldn't always obtain the services of an interpreter in time. And I dare say that all of my clients, they couldn't speak the languages of the people in power the languages of the courts, the authorities, and those really long forms that we had to fill in. I learned to communicate with my clients through drawing pictures, picking up basic sign language, and learning words from the various Aboriginal languages. I spoke up for my clients with as much passion as my little heart could master. I told stories, I wrote letters, and it just never felt like it was enough. I didn't know what to do. And so when a recruiter found me on LinkedIn and helped me to get a job in Hong Kong, I thought that I would do just that. I thought that I would put myself in a fast moving environment with lots of challenges. And then I grow a bigger brain. I mean, I become a better lawyer. And then I'd be able to help solve all the world's problems. Well, that really happened. After working on a fast moving project, I began to discover that I had this ability to think expansively and to see connections between different things really easily. I also realized that I was having sleep issues and that something probably wasn't right. You see, I thought that God told me to be a lawyer so that I could speak up for others. But looking back, I now realize that perhaps God was all along bringing me to a place where I had to learn that I was someone worth speaking up for and that I had to learn how to speak up for myself. When I was five years old, my younger brother was diagnosed with leukemia. Back then, the chances of survival were higher if you could find a bone marrow match, and the chances of finding a match amongst your siblings was one in four. 
Otherwise, it was 1 in 20,000. The short story is that I was in a match and my brother passed away the following year. On top of that, my parents started a charity which helped other people find a bone marrow match. And on the fundraising brochures that went out, there was a quote, my sister's bone marrow didn't match. And inside the brochure, you'd see a photo of my brother with his arm around me. Whether consciously or subconsciously, I guess I took these words to heart and I blamed myself for my brother's death. I felt like I always had to do double to make up for the loss that my parents had suffered. And this work ethic, well, it became my work ethic when I became a lawyer too. And I overextended myself for my colleagues and for my clients. And now, as my sleep issues were taking their toll on me, and I was afraid that if I couldn't fall asleep, I might collapse and die. I really felt like giving up. It was during this moment that I felt God speak to me and say, hey, you might be able to fool the whole world into thinking that you died of overwork, but if you give up this way, you're never going to see your brother again. Somehow, that really woke me up and it really felt like God had seen the depths of my heart and knew how unworthy I felt. I remember my next meal was a fish, vegetables and mashed potatoes. I was, I was just desperately trying to get nutrients into my body and that night, even though I wasn't sure whether I'd be able to fall asleep, I clenched my eyes really tightly and kept them closed because I knew that even if I couldn't fall asleep, at least I had done my part by keeping my eyes closed. Thankfully, I had already been seeking medical help and one of the things that the doctor asked me to do was to get an MRI scan of my brain. As I was entering into the machine, it suddenly hit me. What kind of job was I in that had led me to this machine? And in the days that followed, it dawned on me. Did I really get so stressed because of work? The MRI results were fine. And I went on a journey of discovering my identity and value and I realised that actually, no matter what choices I've made or will make, God's going to love me anyway. Now, I don't expect you to reach the same conclusion, but I didn't want to hide this very important part of where the idea for this talk came from. This is just how I realised that I was someone worth speaking up for and that has made all the difference. Now, I certainly hope that you know that you're someone worth speaking up for, but when it comes to the legal profession, I'm not so sure. Sometimes, I think that we're great as lawyers at advocating for others, but not so great at advocating for ourselves. It's as though we've been taught to take our work really seriously and ourselves not so seriously. I moved back to Melbourne in Australia and joined a different law firm. It took me a while to get my confidence back up, but eventually, I realised that I could still be a lawyer. And actually, I didn't want to make myself miserable during the process. Now, according to statistics, it's actually pretty difficult to not be miserable when you're a lawyer. In 2019, the International Bar Association published its Us Too report on bullying and sexual harassment in the legal profession. This was a survey of almost 7,000 individuals from 135 countries and from across the whole legal profession, from law firms to in-house lawyers, barristers chambers, the judiciary and government. Approximately 
one in three females, said they had experienced sexual harassment in the workplace context. For males, this was one in 14. And when it comes to bullying, the numbers are even worse. Approximately one in two females and one in three males said that they had experienced bullying in the workplace context. Also in 2019, Meritas, which is a global law firm alliance of 183 top-ranking law firms from 92 countries, did a survey of just its Australian and New Zealand law firm members. Now, these were law firms of less than 100 employees each, and the respondents, 200 of them, consisted of lawyers as well as people who weren't lawyers. Out of these respondents, 63% said they had experienced depression or knew someone close to them in the workplace who had. 85% said they had experienced anxiety or knew someone close to them in the workplace who had. It is also important to note that the majority of these respondents also said that they believed and felt that their law firm took their health and well-being seriously and that there were open-door policies that were available for them to seek help. Well, <clears throat> if you're like me, then you love a challenge. And so I've decided that to avoid being miserable as a lawyer, I'm going to take myself seriously and I'm going to speak up for myself. I'm going to speak up in a way that balances the effort that I put into speaking up for my clients into speaking up for myself. These statistics, to me, they're symptoms of workplace environments and cultures which are unhappy and unhealthy. And I believe that if we change ourselves and our actions, then we can change the environments and the cultures that we work in. So let me share with you four ways of how I speak up for myself. One, I spell out my boundaries. Two, I call out behaviour that's unacceptable. Three, I voice out my opinions and ideas. And four, I explore new opportunities and step into them once in a while. Now, people don't always like it when I speak up for myself. And that's okay. I can't blame them. I have really interesting ideas sometimes. And I should probably save them for another talk. And as for exploring new opportunities and stepping into them once in a while, as you heard, from the Northern Territory to Hong Kong to signing up for random things online which have led me to become contractually obliged to giving you this talk. It's okay guys, I don't mind being here. And can you just give me a wave again, just to confirm that you don't mind either? But more seriously speaking, these ideas and these opportunities they're kind of like seeds in my life, and as I nurture them, they help me to grow. And similarly, spelling my boundaries is a great way that has helped me to grow, especially in recent years. Spelling out my boundaries helps me to articulate my limitations and enables me to ask for the support that I need to grow. And as I grow as a lawyer and as a person, then I'm able to achieve much more than I was able to do before. Now, you might think that these plants here refer to growth, but they actually mean much more than that. One morning, I was on Instagram and I saw a post about mental health issues in the legal profession. And a law student had commented on that post and said that as a mentally ill law student, that post meant a lot to her. I reached out to her and said, hey, don't let the diagnosis define you. And after our chat, I potted this plant and it sits on my desk every day to remind me that maybe there are law students out there who have faced challenges or are facing challenges and they're not sure about whether or not they have a place in our profession. If that's you, I want you to know that 
in the right environment and with the right support, which you most probably have to ask for for yourself, you can grow and even thrive as a lawyer. Don't let any diagnosis become part of your identity. But don't be afraid to get a diagnosis either. Oftentimes, it's not what we know that limits us, but what we don't know. And once we know, we can then ask for the support that we need to grow. Before my crisis, you might have thought that my initials SL stood for stupid lawyer or super lawyer because I thought that I could do it all. But now I'm learning that this process of taking myself seriously, even as I take my work seriously, is kind of like sustainable lawyering, another SL. But I think super lawyer still sounds cooler. So I want to propose today that we seek an amendment to the definition of super lawyer. I'd like to appeal to the House of Lawyers that we now start to read the term super lawyer, given that there is no such thing in the world as a super lawyer who can do it all, to mean a lawyer who pursues sustainable growth and works in a sustainable manner. Now, if you're in favour, why don't you just reach out your hand and give me a virtual high five to say that we've just had a party and that we're all parties to this agreement. And on that final note, the fourth way of how I speak up for myself is by calling out behaviour that's unacceptable. Super lawyers know that sometimes after some, something has been called out and things don't change, then we have to change. And that includes moving on. Super lawyers know that it's okay to tap out because the more often that we speak up for ourselves, the more likely it is that we're going to keep speaking up for others. Let me wrap up by giving you a challenge. And that is, after you've taken yourself seriously, try to take yourself not so seriously. What do I mean? Well, after you've done that hard work of speaking up for yourself, then believe that there are people out there who are listening and that they will do the right thing. And that way, you can let go of your ego and then take yourself not so seriously. One of my favourite people in the world is someone I met in the Northern Territory. Her name is Monique Hurley and she's an accomplished human rights lawyer. Monique explains this much better than me. She says that there are two things, giving up your ego and sharing the load. Giving up your ego doesn't mean that you don't have a role to play, but it's an acknowledgement that you're not the saviour of other people and that we need to partner with one another and collaborate in order to make the world a better place for everyone. I wasn't. And I was never meant to be my brother's saviour. And even if my bone marrow had matched, there was no guarantee that my brother would have survived. My parents, on the other hand, they turned their experience into starting this charity, which is called the Bone Marrow Donor Program, and is still continuing in Singapore today. My parents learned to share the load and even though they're no longer involved, they have the faith that the good work that they started will carry on. And as for me, I used to introduce myself as just a kid whose bone marrow didn't match. But if you read between the lines, I'm actually also the kid whose bone marrow has helped many other people around the world find a match and has helped to give them a second chance at life. As ambitious lawyers and law students, 
We can sometimes be so focused on making sure that things go our way. But I want to put it to you that whether or not things go your way doesn't really matter. What really matters is that you know that you matter. You are someone who is worth infinitely more than you can imagine. And you are someone who is absolutely worth speaking up for. My biggest takeaway from my crisis was knowing that I am someone worth speaking up for. And speaking up for myself that comes out of a deep truth of knowing that deeply has made me a better lawyer. Not better in the sense that I'm much more skilled these days at speaking up for my clients, although that is a side effect, but better in the sense that I'm much happier and healthier these days. And I want that for you too. I'm actually here today because I want to speak up for you. I want you to know that there are many different pathways available to someone with a law degree, and I hope that you don't just choose a path that is likely to make you less miserable. Instead, I hope that you speak up for yourself and be true to yourself and choose a path that is more likely to allow you to keep speaking up for others while also speaking up for yourself. Will you be my super lawyer? Thank you.